We are so excited that you've joined us today. You're about to hear a message from our pastor, Mike McFadder from the Crossing Worship Center. Please make sure you are following us on YouTube and Facebook. We pray that this message draws you closer to the Lord and encourages you. Let's go to the Word, Acts chapter 4. We're going to read some words here this morning, and I'm excited to be able to share this with you on this Pentecost Sunday. I felt that the Spirit of the Lord would just have us to honor Him this morning because He was given to us as a gift. He was given to the church. He was poured out on all flesh. And He is the greatest prophecy since Jesus. Now Jesus coming was the Son of God and He was coming to be the Messiah And he was coming to redeem the world from their sins. But he said, I do nothing without the Holy Ghost because except the Spirit draw you, you cannot come. You see, because the Holy Ghost is so necessary right now that we don't really know that the Bible says that he is actually holding back. If you can believe that, because we see so much, but he is actually holding back the evil that will come as soon as the rapture of the church takes place. But until then, (laughs) and I am looking every day, but until he comes, I have been commanded to preach this gospel and to be a witness on this planet that Jesus Christ is real, and what he said he could do, he can do, and he has done, and we are the examples of that and should be those people that believe that. If you'll stand this morning, we're going to honor the word of God. And we're going to read this word. If you don't have your Bibles, I want you to start bringing them. Just to have it in your hand, because I know the enemy's trying to take it from us. But when you don't have it, it's on the monitor here. He said, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest. I got a problem with that. I have a problem being confronted by those who are supposed to be wiser than me, spiritually. He was becunted by the priest, the head of the church of that day, the synagogue, so to speak, that Jewish, that Jewish you know, hierarchy that was waiting on the Messiah, the captain of that temple's guard and some of his Sadducees, these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection from the dead. So they arrested them, and since it was already close to the evening, they put them in the jail until the morning. So to just shut them up, you pin them up. That's what the enemy wants to do. Every day of your life, he wants to put you in some type of prison. Don't forget that. Fight your way out. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. Thank God. Oh, God's still talking to people. So the number that believed now totaled about 5,000 because back in the first two chapters there was 3,000. I believe it got saved when Peter preached. Now we're up to 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. Church is growing immensely, wasn't it? Right in the middle of people wanting to put it in jail. And the next day the council of all the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas and high priest was there along with Caiaphas and John Alexander and other relatives of the high priest, and they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power, say power, Power. and in whose name, say name, name, have you done this? What is this? We'll talk about that in a minute in chapter 3. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, Are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? I just want to know, are we being questioned this morning because we're trying to help somebody? I just need to know where we are, he said. We want everybody to know, is the church being persecuted because we're robbing banks? Or because we're trying to help people get out of sin? Do you want to know how he was healed? 
There was a lame man that was healed standing there. He said, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the power, the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> That's how he was healed. The man you crucified, who are still trying to do that, crucify and throw him out, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to the scriptures where he says, the stone that you believers rejected, that you builders rather rejected, the stone that you rejected has now become the cornerstone. Think about that. What they tried to throw out is what he's building it on. There is salvation in no one else. I suggest the modern Christian church believes that again because you're going to face it not too long when all the religions of this world step up and say we know God. And the only ones that says we can't cohabitate is the Christians, by the way. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And members of the council, and the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. <laughs> they noticed that the ordinary had become extraordinary. They noticed that people who had no special training in the Scriptures were using the power of the Scriptures to change the world around them. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Folks, don't tell me your life doesn't speak to others. They didn't like that. They were trying to deny that. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing that the council couldn't say. You might be seated this morning. On this Pentecost Sunday, in the Old Testament, that Day was known as the Feast of Harvest. It had several names that it was given. And it was a time where Israel would recognize the blessings of God over their harvest. They would bring the grain offerings to God, and it was a time where they would pray over it, and God would bless their seed that whatever they presented would grow into a full harvest. Now I want to talk to somebody this morning that you want to have God bless what you want to do so what you plant will become a full harvest. I know there's some of you this morning who want what God has for your life and it's going to require God to bless it. It's going to require God to give something to you that you don't possess. But in the New Testament, the Greek meaning simply meant 50. So in the Greek, it was simply a 50 that's... 50 days from the Passover. But in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, it was prophesied that as in the Old Testament that as the church became alive or was now coming into the new covenant, that it would need something that only God could give them. Then after doing all of these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, preach, proclaim. Your old men will dream dreams. That means never forgetting what it was that you knew and how that you could present it to it. And your young men will see visions of things that have to come before them. Gives them a goal to shoot for. And in those days I will pour out my spirit even on the servants of men and women alike. Some of the ladies need to say amen. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. 
See, this is where God's trying to move the churches to some deeper thoughts of spiritual things. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn to blood red before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. Folks, there's some hard days coming, baby. Get all that you can get. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise God. For some in Mount Zion and Jerusalem will escape just as the Lord had said. These will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. See, the Holy Spirit is being given out and will be poured out. And that is what happened on the day of Pentecost in chapter 2 of Acts was that prophecy that Joel gave many years before that was now becoming real. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, and we find the reality is, as I was baptized with you with water, John said, and those who repent of their sins and turn to God. Can I tell you again, there's no geezing to get baptized if you're not going to repent and turn from your sin. You're just getting wet. Baptism, water baptism, which we're going to have here before too long, is a symbol of being dead to your old life, raised in the newness of life to be a Christian. But someone is coming soon and who's greater than me, John said, and is much greater than I am, not worthy to even be a slave or carry his sandals. But I'm going to tell you something. When he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Woo! He said, I'm going to come. John said, there's coming one after me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We're not going to just talk about our old sins being washed away. We're going to talk about being endued with power on high to be filled with God, going on to do what God's called us to do. Acts chapter 1, 6, and 9, the Bible talks about the new covenant would make ordinary people extraordinary. It would make failed humanity of creation filled with the Holy Ghost. What you used to have to struggle with will be intensified in the last days. But I'm here to tell you that the power of the Holy Ghost and the fire of God that should be burning in you is a consuming fire. And you don't have to give to the things of this world. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, is this the time to come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone in authority has set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. In other words, don't worry about that. But you will receive power. Say power. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Now for what reason are we baptized in the Holy Ghost initially as a result of that pouring out? And you will be my witnesses. That is the hardest thing you will do on planet earth. Is to live as a witness that Jesus Christ came. Are you saved? Yes. Then be a witness. How? Through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Telling people about he, me, Jesus, everywhere. Starts in Jerusalem, which was the initial capital where they were. Then it moves out into the other skirts of Judea. Then it moves on out further to Samaria. That's what the gospel does. It starts here. It should go out into your house. When it goes from your house, it should go into your family. Once it goes into your family, it should go into your community. Once it goes into your community, it should go into your country. So I asked you this morning, it's obviously not in our country because they're denying Jesus. We, We vote these crazies in all the time, people that deny God. So where is it stopped? At the church, at the house? in our family or in our community. But I'm telling you something, there is a fire of God burning somewhere. Somebody say amen. And we are witnesses. Galatians 5 and 16 is one of my favorite verses because it gives me the encouragement to know that I can do something I couldn't do before I knew Jesus. So I say let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Somebody say amen. That you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You say, why am I struggling? Because your sinful nature still has cravings. And outside of the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be the witness you want to be. So if you're struggling in your flesh, just acknowledge it. That's why we're coming to a fast. You need to overcome the lust of the flesh. How do we do that? Because we're new people. We walk in the Spirit. But Jesus baptized them not only in the Holy Ghost, but he said, I'm going to put a fire in you. 
Yes. Oh, somebody say, I hear God talking to me. It would be set aflame, Hebrews 6 and 1. That term fire, listen to me, that term fire represents maturity. That's what fire does. It changes everything. The Holy Ghost came and he came with fire. Because when you get saved, there's a process of sanctification that's going to have to happen for you. Let me encourage somebody that's just getting in serving the Lord. You're going to be surprised what you go home and still try to do. <laughs> You're going to say, oh my God, why did I do that again? I watch young converts all the time. They'll serve the Lord, they'll get fired up, and it won't be long, they'll drift back. So that's what happens, we start drifting. Why? Because that old flesh wants what it used to want, and that young man, he's still spiritual. He's still young. It's hard to overcome your cravings. So that's why I pray for people to go on, be filled with the Holy Ghost. As soon as you can, get full of the Holy Ghost. That's the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because that's the power that you have to be who you want to be. He said, let us not stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. We shouldn't just be talking about this basic stuff of Christ. Let us go on, he said, instead and become mature in our understanding. This is what I want for you. This is the desire I have. This is why I preach the gospel to you. Not that you stay saved. You're going to be saved if you stay with the Lord. What I want you to do is go on in to a maturity. So how do I do that? Start craving the things of the Spirit. Seeking after Jesus through the Holy Ghost. Let us mature in our understanding so surely we won't need to start again with the fundamentals. How important it is for repenting from our evil deeds and placing our faith in God. Folks, that's the most simple form of Christianity that there is. Is to just say I'm saved. Being full of the Holy Ghost and having that maturity has set you on fire that you can now become who you say you used to couldn't be. It is a continual progression of what God wants to do in your life. It is the New Testament church. He is equipped to be. He is equipped to be a witness by the life that he lives publicly. My title this morning was A Fisherman on Fire. <laughs> oh, the Lord picked out Peter in this chapter 4. Peter and John, they were the disciples that Jesus had went and called out. And maybe you feel like you're just some old has-been and not able to do much for the Lord. God doesn't call a lot of eloquent people. He just went to find somebody that would obey him. And he called Peter and John. This man, Peter, who you know as well as I do, who, who had a proud expression of himself when he first started following the Lord, he made some proclaims that he would never fall and he would never go away, only to find him cursing and leaving Jesus at his most critical time. Have you ever failed the Lord? Have you ever felt like in that falling away that you lost everything? You see, that's the way it feels when we let ourselves be tricked by the powers of darkness. Once we now know the truth, it hurts more to do things we shouldn't do. You see, because I'm supposed to mature, and as I mature, I see that I'm not supposed to do this. And so when I do those things I shouldn't do, it bothers us more. One of the problems I have with church these days is people who claim to be saved have no problem with sin. I know I've had said, wait, I just said it too fast, didn't I? I said, people that claim to be saved have no problem with sin. This is the problem in the modern day church. But see, the Holy Ghost is there to quicken you and I and say, this is not right. You're supposed to have power over your desires. You're supposed to have powers over those lusts. And that's very difficult. Pastor Mike is not making light of those things. Believe me. Believe me, the, the more anointed you get, the older in the Lord you get, I'm telling you, the enemy's going to come back and try you again. 
I need to tell some mature saints this morning who have been filled with the Holy Ghost for years, I'm here to tell you he's going to repackage your sin and bring it back to you a different way. Ain't going to try to get in on you somewhere, somehow. Believe me, he's not just going to let you wreck his kingdom. Come on, somebody. Stay with me this morning. God wants you to see your problem. He don't want you to put your head in the sand if you've got a lust problem. I was studying this week, returned it to Job chapter 31. Job, an upright man of skewed evil. You know the story. God himself said, devil, have you tried my servant Job? This was a man that served the Lord with all of his heart. Job chapter 31 in verse 1 he said, Lord, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not lust after young women. <laughs> this old man of God, God trusted with all his heart, had to do something, make a covenant with my eyes so that I don't get caught up in lusting after young women. You say, well, that is that important? Because it's thankful that God put stuff like that in there. To help you understand that just because you mature doesn't mean you go blind. I'm not deaf to what's out there in that world. I'm not blind to what is. I have to stay full of the Holy Ghost to resist. Did I, hit, did, I, did I tell you you have to stay full of the Holy Ghost to resist? I'm telling you, you, you need to press in on the Spirit of God. You need to ask for that baptism in the Holy Ghost. I just don't know how you are going to overcome your own weaknesses if you do not ask God to help you through the baptism and the fire. The fire of God is important to the church we need to be back on fire again. One thing we lost is our intensity and our fire burned down on the inside of who we are. It will affect everything when you get full of the Holy Ghost. You won't have to go around telling everybody you're saved. You won't have to tell everybody you love the Lord. When you get full of the Holy Ghost, they're going to recognize that you've been with Jesus. Why? Because you cannot leave a man in his problem. Chapter 3 of Acts, Peter comes out of the upper room, runs into a lame man sitting at the gate or the door of the church. I'm sure Peter and John dropped some alms or some money in his bucket because they couldn't help him. What he couldn't do before he got filled with the Holy Ghost, he now can do. <laughs> what you're trying to help somebody with right now won't last. They'll have to have something else. But if you get full of God, when you go by him, please hear me, leaders. When you get full of God in this last hour, they will recognize that you have something extraordinary. And you've been with Jesus. And the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. That's the lame man. And when they realized he was the lame beggar, they had seen so often at the gate beautiful. They were absolutely astounded. Don't let me bore you. Stay with me. They all rushed out in amazement to see Solomon's head where, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. A man who could not walk, lay. had strength, stood to his feet and went home silent. Most of the church goes, what did he just say? They say, well, I'm sorry. No. Bible says he stood to his feet and he praised God. Why? Because he had been changed. He was better off. Something had happened to him that had not happened before. What was the difference in all these people that had passed by him before? Who gave him a little money the day before? He gave him a little money the Sunday before. What had happened was about two days before that, the Holy Ghost had been poured out in the upper room. And Peter and John were now full of the Holy Ghost rather than full of themselves. 
they were now full of the Holy Ghost and they come out of that upper room knowing that they had been dued with power. Folks, what do you need in this last days? You need more power. You need the fire of God to burn deep within your soul. That's why he gave us this Pentecost Sunday. And the Bible says, Peter saw his opportunity to address the crowd and people of Israel. He said, what is it surprising about this? Peter acted like it should be normal. Why stare at us as though we had some, this man to walk by our own power of godliness? Man, I know they, in this 2022, they some big shots in the church. They some hierarchy that rattles these pulpits that you can't even get close to them. We got more titles than the doctor that you go to see about your sore foot. We got more PhDs and psychiatrists. But we don't have no power. They pray for you and nothing happens. Their life affects nothing, changes nobody. They walk by them and still they remain the same. He said, why do you think what happened to this? He said, for he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He brings them all the way back to that. The God of our own, our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. That's what the healing was for, folks, was to bring honor and glory to God. He said, this same Jesus whom you have handled over and rejected before Pilate despised Pilate's decision to release him. You had a chance to do it right, and you chose Barabbas. You rejected his holy, righteous one and instead demanded that the release some murderer. That's still going on. That's still happening. We'd, have, we'd rather talk about some nasty, sinful preacher than we had somebody that's truly on fire for God. All we want is give us these people full of themselves. It's fleshly nature that t- tells us that they're strong. Never heard anybody that was walking with God talk about himself very much. And this fire accompanied the presence of the Holy Ghost was now accompanying these men. You killed him. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead, and we are the witnesses of this fact. How do you know he is saved? Because I now have been changed in front of you. The old man of God said, don't ask me what I think about myself. He said, ask my wife. Don't ask my husband. Don't ask me about myself. Ask my husband. Ask somebody that knows me. He said, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before? Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. This is after the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is what was going on. This is why Pentecost was so amazing. My last point is this. Fire always accompanies the presence of God. And fire makes things hard or fluid. They will harden a piece of steel in fire. If you put the fire to a piece of steel, it will light up. It will get glowing red, almost white. It will be so hot. But if you add and continue to heat that same material that gets hard without the heat, if you continue to heat it, that same iron will become a liquid. You see, God wants to liquefy our lives and make us flow with him. Water is the same way. Water without heat is a solid. It'll turn into an ice, but if you had any the least amount of warmth to it, it'll melt and become a fluid. But listen to me. If you continue to heat it, it turns to a vapor and goes higher. If you heat the metal, it becomes fluid. It can flow. It'll touch everything. A volcano flowing out. When it's on fire, it touches a tree. And it lights and ignites it. Anything it touches, it it ignites with fire. That's why Jesus baptized them with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now everything they touch turned on fire. That's where the church has got to get back if we're going to be effective in the last days. That no matter where we go, we set it aflame. Why? Because they recognize we have been with Jesus. And how do they know it? 
well, I've been to college or I've been to school. No, by the results that we found in our own lives. By the results that you found in your own life. They recognized. Go back to Acts 4 and 13 and 14. I'll close. That powerful day of the Pentecost when they come out of the upper room. They began to touch everything around them and it turned and changed. The fire of God was in their life and they were changed. People around them were changed. And people recognized. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training. How many times do I hear that in church? Pastor, I just don't have any special gifts. Why don't you just get full of the Holy Ghost and be turned on fire and see what God can do through your life? Maybe you don't have to have all those gifts. You can just walk through your family and they'll be saved. They couldn't deny the fact that they had been with Jesus because the, blind, the lame man was standing right there in the middle of them. When I first got saved, went from being who I was to being who God wanted me to be. The first people around me that noticed was my family. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to follow us on YouTube and Facebook so you don't miss out on any future content from the Crossing Worship Center. Thank you again and God bless.